Good evening. It's so good to have you join us tonight as we continue our study of Isaiah. And yes, we're getting close to the end of the book. And yes, I know we could have spent many, 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 many more months studying this great book, but hopefully you've enjoyed it. But we're getting right into the, the getting into chapter 59 of Isaiah today. And But before we get into the scripture, let me welcome you and let me also uh, pray with you. Let's take our needs to the Lord and ask God to be with us today, to touch us, to open up our understanding. And I tell you, I know I love it when God reveals a new truth to me. It's not a new truth, but it's new truth to me. And I get excited seeing how God's word works. And I'm excited to share with you today. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you for who you are. You're not a ghost. You're not a spirit. You're the spirit, the spirit of the living God. And so, Holy Spirit, we ask you to minister and touch people's hearts and lives today. Let this word, the word of God, come alive in our hearts and lives and help it be so meaningful. And Father, we know also that you are Jehovah Rapha, our healer. And many people need a touch in their bodies today, and we lift them up to you. I think it's specific particularly of that one that has a severe back condition. The doctor said there's not much they can do, but we ask you just to do the miraculous. Father, we give you praise and many, many, many other needs that I have no idea what they are. You tell us in your word that you know what we have need of even before we ask. So we ask today that you would just minister and touch those needs. Let your word come alive today in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. As I've already mentioned, we're starting today in Isaiah chapter 59, and I want to read that first verse and comment a little bit, the first introductory statement. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. Now, I like the New Living Translation. It makes it a little bit more understandable in our present language where it says, listen, the Lord is not too weak to save you. Let me say that again. Listen, the Lord is not too weak to save you, and he is not becoming deaf. He can hear you when you call. Now, Isaiah starts off this chapter with this wonderful reminder that God hears you. He's not deaf. He's not going deaf. I know my hearing's not as good as it used to be, and so I have to sometimes have someone repeat something. But the reality is God knows what we have need of even before we ask, but he is not getting hard of hearing, so you don't need to yell. You don't have to shout. Let me remind you, he's not nervous, so shouting doesn't bother him, but he can hear your cry. And I think it's so interesting the way he starts this uh, chapter out saying, listen, the Lord is not too weak to save you. He can save you. He can minister to you. But the problem is then he gets into a more difficult segment to grasp. Maybe not to grasp, but to yield to, because he begins to talk about confessing our sins. I think we could say he begins to talk about humility, because throughout the Bible, we hear the words, humble yourself, humble yourself, humble yourself. And the biggest issue of humbling ourselves many times is when we have to admit that we're wrong when we have to confess that we've sinned, when we have to realize that we have failed God. He says, humble yourselves to admit that because, listen, God still has the power to save you. Well, let's think about it from that line as we begin into this 59th chapter, which the segment says, the confession of sins. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities or your sins have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. For your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt, your lips have spoken lies, and your tongue mutters wicked things. No one calls for justice. No one pleads his case with integrity. They rely 
on empty arguments and speak lies. They conceive trouble and give birth to evil. They hatch the eggs of vipers and spin a spider's web. Whoever eats their eggs will die. And when one is broken, an adder is hatched. An adder, of course, being a viper. Viper, of course, being a snake. And says the cobwebs are useless for clothing. They cannot cover themselves with what they make. Their eeds are evil deeds. Man, God's kind of speaking strong here. He'd tell us, hey, I'll listen and hear you when you call, but you need to confess. You need to repent. goes on saying, your feet rush into sin. They're swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are evil thoughts. Ruin and destruction mark their ways. The way of peace they do not know. There's no justice in their paths. They have turned them into crooked roads. No one who walks in them will know peace. So justice is far from us. And righteousness does not reach us. Why? Why? Because we're walking in sinfulness. It says we look for light, but everything's dark. For brightness, but we walk in deep shadows. Let the like the blind we grope along the wall, feeling our way like men without eyes. At midday we stumble as if it were twilight. Among the strong we are like the dead. We all growl like bears. We mourn mournfully like doves. We look for justice, but we find none. For deliverance, but it's far away. For our Offenses are many in your sight, and our sins testify against us. Our offenses are ever before us, and we acknowledge our iniquities, our rebellion and treachery against the Lord, turning our backs on God, formating oppression and revolt, uttering lies our hearts have conceived. So justice is driven back, and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found. And whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. What a dire statement. A statement that should grip our hearts, and we have to ask the question, God, have I been willing to humble myself? Have I been willing to admit my weaknesses? Now, let me be the first to tell you that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, where none of us are perfect. No, not one. We understand that. So what's he talking about here? He's talking about a people that are speaking one thing, but living another. He's talking about people that know to do right, but don't do it. He's talking about a people that see injustice and ignore it. He's talking about people that are seeing sinful acts and then don't even speak about it. The reality is we cannot hide our head in the sand like the proverbial ostrich. We cannot do that. We have to look and we see what's going on around us and we realize that we live in a sinful world. And you say, well, we can't change the world. That is true. But we can change ourselves by submitting to God, by resisting the devil. So we begin by submitting to God and realizing that we have sinned. We cannot ignore the fact that sinfulness is all around us, and sometimes we walk into that sin. I know for me, I remember the scripture says that if we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And man, I can be doing great. I can be walking in the spirit. I can be praising God. I can be driving down the road, singing praises to God. And then something happened or somebody would say something. Somebody pull out in front of me. And all of a sudden, I'm not walking in the spirit. I'm walking in the flesh. And I think sometimes when we look at society, we see all the hurts 
And we wonder, well, I can't do anything. What can one person do? I know that you've heard this story, but the story of a young man that was walking down the beach, young boy, and he was finding the sand dollars. He was looking at them and throwing them back in the ocean. And a man saw him and said, son, you realize that there are thousands of of those uh, sand dollars that go on shore and that you're not making a difference. And he looked at the one in his hand and just as they began to sling it back in the water, he said, I can make a difference in that one. And sometimes we can't make a difference in maybe the overall picture, but we can impact those around us. We can do what we can do. And says the Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. I realize this was written by Isaiah well before the time of Christ. So close to 3,000 years ago, it was written. He says that God looked and he was displeased. Let me just ask you, in your honest opinion, is God looking at your neighborhood, looking at your church, looking at your family, looking at you and saying he was displeased because there's no justice. And again, I realize we can't speak for the world, but it begins with each one of us. It begins with each one of us, and we take a a step in the right direction because it goes on to say this. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. No one to intervene. So his own arm worked salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and he put the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garment of vengeance and wrapped himself in the zeal and a cloak according to what they have done. So will he repay wrath to his enemies, and retribution to his foes. He will repay the islands their due. From the west, men will fear the name of the Lord. And from the rising of the sun, they will revere his glory. For he will come like a pent-up flood that the breath of the Lord drives along. One translation says, like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will come in. Oh, I love the fact that when we think there's no hope, when we think everything is falling apart, when we look around us and see a world full of sin, we have to remember that God sees that as well. And the only person that he's going to hold you accountable for is you. We're each held accountable for our own sins. We're each one held accountable for our own actions. And so he wants us to live a life of godliness. And I believe that he was referring to the coming of Jesus Christ here in this passage. But he says the Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who repent of the sins, declares the Lord. And then he promises the Spirit. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you and my words that I put in your mouth will not be depart from your mouth or from the mouths of your children or from the mouths of their descendants from this time on and forever, says the Lord. Oh, I tell you, one of the things that thrilled me about this passage as I was looking at the the negativity that God speaks about the sinfulness around us, the sinfulness of the world. And I began to think, well, God, uh, The world is sinful. But then I noticed something else that really, really spoke to me. That God never tells us the consequences without giving us a solution. I know in our political arena, I really get frustrated with people that can tell me what's wrong with everybody. What's wrong with our system? What's wrong with other people? We know this wrong. Don't tell me what's wrong. Tell me what can be done to correct it. And God not only tells us what is wrong. God not only tells us that we're sinful. He tells us what we need to do about it. And how do we do that? 
goes back to what I started with. We've got to humble ourselves and pray. And as we humble ourselves and pray and turn from our wicked ways, a lot of people like the praying part. And I think everybody knows that I believe in prayer. But friends, if you're praying without humbling yourself, those prayers are not going to avail too much. And if you're praying and not turning from your sinful ways, then you're not living what we're speaking. So I think those three segments that we must humble ourselves, we must pray, and we must turn from our wicked ways. What does it mean, turn from your wicked ways? Repent. The word repentance makes an about face that we repent and turn away from our wicked ways. We change directions. And I realize that when we're new converts and new Christians, sometimes it has to be a, a slower turn. Even though God has made us a new creature, sometimes there's things that baggage that we've got to start dropping by the wayside. And that's the sinfulness that we look at. So God is telling us today, Look around you, not in the world, but in your world. Look in your world, right around you, and see if there's things that you need to address, that you need to take care of, that you need to surrender to God. See, surrender and humility go hand in hand until we acknowledge that we're sinful, we really have not humbled ourselves. You know, I was thinking about the fact when we tell somebody to stick them up. What do we want them to do? Stick up their hands. What is the sticking up their hands? That's a surrender. That's a saying, hey, I'm not doing anything. I'm not going for a gun. I'm not doing anything. I'm yielding myself to you. That's a humbling of ourselves. I believe that's what God is asking of many Christians today. And you say, well, the world is that. We're not talking about the world. We're talking about you. We're talking about me. We're talking about the Christians. Now, if you're not a Christian, then you need to humble yourselves and turn to God, and God will save you. But for those of us that are Christians, we know that God has already redeemed us. He has already done so much for us, but He's asking us to humble ourselves, to surrender to Him. Because when we surrender to Him, then we realize that God Here's our prayer. Let me go back to that first verse again that we read. Listen, the Lord is not too weak to save you. Now, is that just for the sinner or is that for those of us that strive to be godly? Because we drift away. We allow things to come into our lives that are not godly. And we begin to be self-centered. And so God said, listen, The Lord is not too weak to save you. Then he goes on to say, and he is not becoming deaf. He can hear you when you call. So what's the secret? No secret. Very plain. Humble ourselves. Admit that we need God. Admit that the problem is bigger than us. In my years of dealing with alcoholics, dealing with someone with a drinking problem, and I'm sure it's the same for drugs or for any other thing, the first step is to admitting that we need help. Admitting that it's bigger than we are. Maybe you're struggling with something today. Alcohol, pornography, drugs, a bad temper. All of those things are bad. Until we realize, hey God, It's bigger than I am. I want to humble myself. I'm going to submit to you. And as I submit that to you, and as I strive in the flesh to resist the devil, because I've submitted to you, we're more than conquerors. And the devil has to flee. So I surrender to you today. And God, as we close this session in prayer, I want us to surrender to you. I want to surrender to you, Father, give you my cares, give you my concerns, my weaknesses, and believe you that you would hear because you're not deaf and you're not going deaf and you are not too weak to save. Let me pray with you and pray for you. Father, 
I'm thankful that we serve a powerful God, a God that knows how weak we are, a God that knows that sometimes in ourselves we are powerless. But thanks be to God, we have victory in you and we can surrender ourselves to you. We can humble ourselves to you, give ourselves to you, and then you will hear our prayers. But Father, we have to pray. We have to pray. Even if it's under a breath, we've got to pray. And you hear those prayers because you're not deaf and you're not going deaf. But we humble ourselves and pray and then turn from our wicked ways. God, you're going to not only hear us, you're going to save us. Help us to live a life so pleasing to you that people may see our good works and glorify the Father. And God, we give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Trust you've had a great week and that you'll have a greater week next week. Thank you for joining. <music>